Well, thinking about um, the family and thinking about children, if you're thinking about the 19th century, you'll be thinking less about the state and you'll be thinking more about, about households and communities. One of the biggest changes, again, I, when I think about history, I tend to think first about daily life, like what, what was life like for people as they went through the daily and weekly and seasonal rounds of, of, of what they did. And a, a, huge, a huge difference occurred with urbanization, it occurred with industrialization, but it also occurred with the growth of the state or that um, organized collective um, inside a liberal democracy where people actually have elections and, and uh, come to, to uh, collective decisions to a certain extent about what happens. The 19th century was very unusual historically speaking in the uh, North America and in, and in Europe and other places as well for the growth of, of the state for something that was separate from families or a group of families, separate from, um, different from, usually just a particular elite inside a community. So the state was something that was elected by a, a wide swath of people and that who got to elect people changed o over the course of the 19th century in Canada as elsewhere with the trend being, generally being, to having more people and more kinds of people be allowed to vote and to create this to elect people who were uh, part of the state. Of course in Canada the um, uh, we had some changes in the late 19th century that removed people's right to vote in the case of First Nations people, um, uh, people from Asia and um, I think that's those are the two groups that were most disenfranchised but gen but women uh, began to get the vote st starting in the late 19th century at the municipal level. One of the big changes in the late 19th century was the growth of that state inside the liberal democracy. So people found themselves again living in cl often living in closer urban quarters. There needed to be more People, a lot of people felt that there should be more regulations, more laws, more state, because there, were, there was much more room for conflict when you have a hundred people living uh, in a building as opposed to, to nine or, or seven. So, um, so there was lots of, so the involvement of the state became more and, and more intense. So the growth of the educational state was an important element in the growth of, of the state inside Canada. Compulsory schooling was brought in in most provinces uh, across the country in the 1870s and it created a lot of trouble for, for, for people. We know from the work that historians do that most people were in fact sending their children to school. Um, even though it wasn't compulsory, but compulsory education really cut in to some of the earlier patterns and ways of life that that that, that families had. So, for example, um, in in Canada, we have uh, really really long summer holidays um, for for schools, and that comes directly out of Canada's agricultural nature at the time when compulsory schooling was brought in because the family said, you know, there's no way that we can have our, our kids in school during, you know, the summer. Like, they've got to be there. They've got to be helping us, you know, do the work of the household because children were a really hugely significant part of, of the labor force inside any household. It wasn't just, you know, one or two adults who went out to, to work to earn money to support the family. Children were um, just absolutely crucial um, workers in, in rural, par rural parts of Canada. So for example, um, people would work, children would work really starting from the time they were three or four, they might start working um, on, in rural areas by uh, sitting in a field and their job would be to hit as many birds who were trying to eat the seeds as possible out of a, a little pile of stones that they, they would be working from. Children, um, th there were quite big gender divisions in what girls and boys did in, in terms of daily work. Girls tended to do work closer to, to the farm itself or the rural household itself, working on all those 
tasks, that most of which are now automated. So, for example, simply getting water occupied um, a large part of, of, of each day. Disposing of dirty water was, was easier, um, but still a, an important part of the task. Gathering, well, you, getting wood, all the things that were involved in simply getting wood to heat a house and to, to cook people's food. It's estimated that about one-fifth of all waking hours of, of, of um, certainly of men who were mainly responsible for getting wood was spent just in, just in working with the wood, going out, get, finding the trees, cutting the trees down, hauling them back to a place where the wood would be first cut and then stored in, um, in cords, stored to be dried. It had to be dried for several months. Then there was another stage that involved cutting it into stove lengths that would fit into the stove and um, stacking that close to the house. And then there was another layer of work which was just uh, usually happened quite close to the kitchen door which would just be um, uh, cutting the wood, in, in, cutting it in, in quarters uh, so that it could, it could burn more easily. And then they also cut um, kindling, which was yet another stage, and then bringing the wood into, um, into the house to be burned. I interviewed a woman um, once who, who was raised with, uh, just with a, with a wood stove, no electricity in, in rural Canada. And um, she had raised her own family as well, in, as well as being a child in the family. And she said to me when I was talking to her, she said, I don't know how, how people can raise boys without a wood stove. I said, what do you mean? Like, she said, well, how can you discipline your sons? So easy with a wood stove. You just say, no work. That means we have no wood and there's no food. And she, they, would, they learned really early that that was the work that they needed to do. <laughs> so, um, so yeah, those, those kinds of activities were very much involved everybody in the family. Uh, cooking, everything from cooking. Most, most uh, rural families had grew some of their own produce, had some of their own fruit trees if they were in an area where, could ha where they could have that. But almost everybody grew, not only grew some of, of what they needed to eat and got their own fuel in the form of wood, um, but they also had to preserve the food because in, in our climate you can't have gardens, you know, 10, 11, or far less, 12 um, months of the year. Food has to be preserved and that, that work was done mainly by women and girls, uh, by canning, which was really putting food in, in bottles. This was from, from the late 19th century, well into the 20th, in, into the 1940s. Most Canadian households were still cooking with wood in 1941, we know, thanks to the census, and, um, and an awful lot of people were still preserving their own food.